and I suspect that a lot of girls who start wearing it for those reasons don't continue for any length of time. <laughs> but I wouldn't like to see the burqa achieving that same, you know, rebellious cachet, that same sartorial, you know, um, <coughs> status as much as I admire defiance in most circumstances. <laughs> there's defiance and there's just stupid, but, you know. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Shakira. Julie, do you want to... Um, like Shakira, I find myself um, sleeping with the enemy, so to speak, in, in this debate to an extent. And I started, um, my interest in faith sprang from being raised as a conservative Anglican Christian. And um, while I still maintain some of those, um, those values and beliefs, I left the Anglican Church as a result of um, uh, feeling incredibly oppressed in the context of a debate around women's ordination in the early 90s. So that's, that's my background, which may make some of you think, how ironic then that I should defend what is perceived as, um, as such an act of oppression. But for all of the reasons outlined, I maintain that. And I have to say that when I first started looking at this issue as I did to do a case study around the media's coverage of the hijab, my views were much more closely aligned with Virginia's. It's through several years of, of research and talking with Muslim women at length, which is something that as journalists you rarely get the chance to do in your daily practice in you know, the, the incredibly um, tumultuous world of the daily news feed. Um, but what, what I, this is my final conclusion, that the media tend to speak on behalf of or at Muslim women too frequently instead of speaking with them. And I, I do think the way forward is to build opportunities for dialogue, to build bridges, if you like, to encourage self-empowerment <laughs> rather than to um, blow up you know, such bridges through um, what tend to be divisive and counterproductive calls for bans on things like burqas or niqabs or hijabs. Um, and to many Muslim women, those calls and the debates that surround them can feel just as oppressive as the burqas themselves. And I think we need to, to think very carefully about the impacts um, of our discussions and our, the imposition of our own values and ideas and ideals um, on the people who we are dictating to. Thank you. The last word here to Virginia. Um, like Shakira and Julie, I also find myself metaphorically in bed with <coughs> strangers who I'm not comfortable <laughs> with at all. Um, it's very strange how, how this can happen, but uh, I guess I'm a little bit used to it. Um, <coughs> the, I'm looking forward to the time in Australia when um, uh, Muslim feminists are more outspoken about this issue. I've been waiting for that for some time and I'm not hearing a lot of it. The, the Muslim feminist um, uh, movement in France, the one that was, um, was initially run by Fidela Amara, who is now in, in government, it's called Not Whores Nor Submissives. They've been working for years and years. They grew out of the ghettos. And they've been working for years and years to actually stop the use of the hijab as well as the burqa because they believe that it is oppressive of women. And this is a feminist Muslim women's group. So I'm looking uh, forward... No, actually, I phoned their office and I said that I was interested in work in issues concerning Muslim women and they said, in France... Sorry, my supervisor would do my, the accent much better. In France, we have lassite. Lassite. And, and we don't use words like Muslim women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is all about lassite. But look, just move, moving on from that, um, there is... It, it is such a complex debate and we could... Honestly, we could talk for weeks about this, but... There has been a move uh, in Saudi Arabia just uh, late last year by one cleric by the name of Sheikh Mohammed Al Habadan, forgive my pronunciation, who's now calling for the one eye niqab. The one eye niqab. <laughs> I kid you not. And his reasoning is because showing both eyes is seductive and it allows women to use makeup. Now, I, I come back to my point what is so terribly wrong with a woman's face, a woman's expression, and most importantly, what is so terribly wrong with a woman having free agency? That's my point, and that's what we need to keep in mind when we're talking about banning the burqa and the niqab in Australia. It is un-Australian.
on, on your behalf, I'd like to thank uh, Virginia, Julie and Shakira, for, I think for really a wonderful discussion. I think the debate has been very, very rich. We could go on and on, and, uh, but we need to uh, leave the room now. But I'd like to thank you all for participating. The audience for some terrific questions, and I apologize again to all those people I couldn't get to, and also to our friends on uh, Twitter and uh, for tweeting away so uh, uh, generously there. So many thanks to everybody and to our panelists.